Excuse me, do you know where the toilets are? Big top, where's like, that? Like, kids, no, no starfish, I've just got absolutely no idea where we're going. PQS, I have up to Toilet? Oh, yeah, come starfish. on, Jay. Fart. Go there in a minute. Kay. Kay. Jay, fuck. Right, what? this way. Excuse me, where, where are we going? No, we'll eat later, we'll eat later. Oh, I've just got no idea where I'm going. Charlie? Charlie! Thought it was you, good to see you. Emma? I wasn't sure whether or not you were coming. Emma, it is you! I thought I saw you when I was signing in. Tatty Bible, smart shoes, isn't that Emma from Brighton, I thought to myself, and sure enough it is. How are you? Well, really well. How was your journey? Fine. Though I think it took me longer to get parked than it did to drive here. Yeah. Spring harvest gets busier each year. The crowd was bustling, everyone waiting in eager anticipation. Great, isn't it? This is my fifth. Only five? I've been coming here for ages. Can't wait to get stuck in again. Though I don't think I've bought enough brain cells to cope with a seminar list this year. I'm glad you said that. It's not just me then. Yeah. The opening worship was starting. The crowd surged forward to take their places. What would happen? What miracles would take place? How would God move? Where should they sit? At the back. People were fighting for seats at the back, well away from the speaker's eye, or the possibility of being caught mid-yawn by the video relay. When I see those big screens, I can't help but thinking about all the effort that goes into this. Is it really worth it? Oh, don't get me wrong, I love coming here, and worship is obviously important, so are the seminars. But just as long as it's not a load of hot air, People need to go home fired up to make a difference to society, to the poor. Are Christians really doing? Enough. I've had enough. All year spent giving out. Now I need something for me. No one gets excited about God in my church. And I'm just so sick of yesterday's dried up hymn sandwiches. <laughs> I don't think I can take any more. Stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. I long to spend some time with Jesus, some deep time with Jesus like I used to. I just need a few days of really worshipping. God. I need God. I work 14 hour days in a place which is about as hostile to God as anywhere can be. I daren't even have one of those fish thingies in the back of my car. The trouble is, I can't talk to any of my Christian friends about it, because then they'll ask me what I do for a living and then I'd have to lie. The place was filling up. Everywhere there were trendy looking youth workers and accountants on holiday. Yep, I can see you. <laughs> Everyone happy, smiling, without a care in the world. I feel guilty. Part of me wants to be like them, singing and dancing for God. But it's wrong, isn't it? I mean, while I'm singing, dancing here in Skegness, people are begging on the streets. Children are being abused. The rich are getting richer. At least here at the back, I won't feel so... Bad. I know it's wrong, but the marketplace these days is so cutthroat. I have to slip people backhanders. I have to offer sweeteners. Otherwise, the company won't win the contracts. My boss isn't interested in morality. The pressure is horrendous. I've got two children to look after. We need the money. I can't talk to anyone about it. And as for Jesus, I can't imagine. What would it be like to really meet with Jesus in my church? Impossible, I imagine. <laughs> I get so angry, so wound up. All I ever do is complain about everything. I mean, all I can do is tell people how hard I find it in my home church. I long to feel different. I long to make a difference, but I'm just so busy. I long to be different. I'm so frustrated, so short of love. Short of peace. Short of freedom. Because they were all so short, they found it impossible to see. <laughs> there was too much in the way, so they climbed to a place where they could hide and watch. Why haven't I got enough faith to build an orphanage or move to Africa? Why can't I stop complaining and start loving people? If I change my life, maybe God could do something with me. I doubt it. Everyone I see is sorted with God. Except me. And today, God, when you come, 
You'll anoint evangelists and worship leaders. And give people visions. And you'll fill them up with your Holy Spirit. All... Except me. Except me. Guitars strummed. The worship band played. People began to sing. Then Jesus came. And when he reached the place where they were hiding, he said, I can see you. I can see you, Zacchaeus. I must stay at your house today. He made haste and came down and received him joyfully. I knew it wouldn't happen to me. I wanted it too much. <laughs> it always happens to other people. Zacchaeus. Yes? I want to talk with you. Me? But haven't you already? I want to talk with you. But this is the woman that always slanders her church in the seminar queues. <laughs> but she made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Perhaps I'm not bad enough. <laughs> Does God only choose those who are really good or really bad? Zacchaeus, are you coming down? Are you coming as well? Me? My name's not Zacchaeus. You've got it wrong. I still want to meet you. I want to visit your house today. And yours. And you in that yellow jacket. And you, yep, the trendy looking youth worker. And you, the accountant on holiday. Put so the they came on. down to meet the Lord. Everyone who felt a little short. Every Zacchaeus who was trapped in corruption and compromise. Who longed to be close to Jesus. Who could change the lives of the poor. And Jesus said, Today, salvation has come to your house. Yours. You. Yours. 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 And you. 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 Thank you, Roughshod. That was wonderful. It's a real uh, privilege for me to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Gerard Kelly. He's got to be an honorary Irishman with a name like that. And um, for those of you who've been coming to Spring Harvest, Gerard won't be any uh, stranger to you because he's served Spring Harvest for many years. But he does have a life outside of Spring Harvest as well. He's a poet. And I always tell everybody, Gerard's book, um, his book of poetry always comes with me whenever I, whenever I go anywhere because I absolutely love his poetry. And uh, he's an author, he's a speaker, and he's a motivator. Currently, he's working uh, with a, a thing called CafeNet, which you can read, get information about in uh, Skyline. And that is bringing on another generation of leaders through mission to Europe and motivating them. And so it's with real pleasure tonight that we welcome Gerard to come and speak to us. Why don't you join me in welcoming him? Thank you, Priscilla. I will speak to you later about the honorary bit. Uh, the Irish is real. Not the accent, but I am really Irish. Hey, it's really, 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 really great to see you here tonight. Hasn't it been wonderful to come together and to begin on such a high note of praise? Why don't you, uh, how many of you had a, a difficult journey getting here today? A few of you. Why don't you just turn to the person next to you and say, it's an honor, a joy, and a privilege, and quite frankly, a relief to be sitting in the big top with you tonight. It's wonderful to be here. Okay, we're going to um, pick up this theme of You've Got Mail, which is our theme for the whole week, and I'm going to introduce it by looking in a few moments at this wonderful story of Zacchaeus that we've just had so uh, brilliantly uh, put across to us. Um, but let's just think a bit about receiving mail, because uh, that's a really good excuse to have a bit of fun for a couple of minutes. I don't know if you have an email account, I'm sure many of you do. Uh, if you have, you will know that one of the unbreakable rules of email, what they call email protocol, 
is that if you have an account, you have to have at least one friend who believes that it's their moral responsibility to send you all the jokes they get. Um, I have uh, one such friend. Thankfully, he's a uh, profound Christian leader, so he doesn't some, send me the really dodgy ones, just the slightly dodgy ones. Uh, but I get all sorts of stuff into my uh, in-tray on email. And I got a couple recently that I really, really liked, a couple of news stories. One of them was about a lady who was, uh, her name was uh, given to me as Mrs. Alton, I have no idea what her real name was, who uh, was woken in the middle of the night, looked out of her bedroom window, only to find with horror that her garden shed was being robbed by a group of men. I don't know if you heard this story. And uh, so she phoned the police immediately on the phone in the bedroom. She said, my garden shed is being robbed by a group of men. If you come quickly, you can catch them right now, red-handed. She thought, oh, great, the police will be so pleased. Unfortunately, the policeman on the phone said, I'm sorry, madam, we have no officers available in your area. We can't do anything. So she put the phone down and watched them rob her garden shed. Then she picked the phone up again, and she said, gave her name and address again, and said, I've just phoned about these men robbing my garden shed. You don't need to come now. I've shot them. <laughs> Within minutes, her house was surrounded <laughs> by armed police, and there was a helicopter with a searchlight sweeping her garden. The men were arrested. A senior police officer came to her and said, I thought you said you'd shot them, to which she replied, I thought you said you didn't have any officers available <laughs> in the area. <laughs> The other one I see recently was a report from a newspaper somewhere in Africa, I don't quite know where, about a guy who was fired from his job as a hotel cleaner. He lasted four days in the job, which was how long it took him to take the first job they gave him. It was a 20-story building with uh, two lifts running up the middle, and they asked him as his first task as a cleaner to clean the lifts. He promptly disappeared and didn't, wasn't seen again for four days. He came back four days later and said, I've finished. They said, why did it take you four days to clean the lifts? To which he replied, because you've got so many of them. There's two on each floor, that's 40 lifts, and when I went to clean some of them, they weren't even there. <laughs> and uh, Priscilla, you'll notice I didn't say that that came from an Irish newspaper. <laughs> I could have done. Okay, and I want to read you this. This is my favorite example of uh, receiving mail. Some of you may have heard this before, but I don't care because I really like it. This is called The Letter Home. Dear Mum and Dad, It's been three months since I left for university. With Christmas coming, I thought I ought to write with my news. I'm sorry to have been out of touch, but so much has been happening and I've been so busy. Now, please sit down. Mum and Dad, do not read any further until you are sitting down. Well, first of all, I'm much better now. My broken leg has healed and the burns hardly show. The fireman said jumping from the window was the right thing to do, and just in time before the roof came in. The police, though, have agreed not to press charges. If anything, it will be the guy who sold us the so-called indoor fireworks who's liable for prosecution. And the university have agreed to let me pay off the damages over 20 years. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not homeless. Marco. The guy who found me when I fell from the window came to visit me in hospital and we became quite close. In fact, I've moved into his flat. Well, I say flat, it's more of a bed sit, really. But it means I can use the rent you've been sending me to pay off the fire damage. Marco is lovely. He has a steady job, Dad, and looks great in his uniform. And the people at McDonald's have said he can go full time as soon as he's got five stars. <laughs> We're saving everything we can for the wedding. Oh, yes. I'm getting married. I can't believe it's all happened so fast. We haven't fixed the date yet, but it will definitely be before my pregnancy begins to show. <laughs> oh, I haven't told you, you're going to be grandparents. I'm so excited. Marco has been great, and has said he'll bring up the child as if it was his own. <laughs> Brian, the father, is helping financially, but he can only do so much. Professors are under so much pressure these days. <laughs> So, Mum and Dad, I need to tell you, I haven't had an affair with my professor. I'm not pregnant, there is no marker, there was no far, I haven't been injured. But it looks like I will get a D in English this term and an F in French and history. <laughs> and I wanted you to see this news in its proper perspective. <laughs> Your ever-loving daughter, I don't know, Priscilla, maybe, who knows? <laughs> OK, 
Okay? So receiving mail is a good thing. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. There is an excitement about it. There's an excitement. I actually feel always excited when I receive a handwritten uh, letter because um, I don't like all the other ones. I get tired of them. But I love receiving a handwritten letter and I love the smell of ink and all that kind of stuff. And uh, this title, You've Got Mail, has been chosen because we just have such a strong sense as a team, not just that it's the key to understanding these letters to the seven churches, but it's a sense of what we, what we feel as we gather, that God has got mail for each one of us, that God has things to say to us, and that it's personally addressed. And that's a really, really good um, link, if you like, to this story of Zacchaeus, because Zacchaeus discovered that this Jesus he'd heard so much about had mail for him. Now, as we start to explore this story, our uh, wonderful stewards are going to be uh, handing out to you some little, little plastic beads, tiny, tiny, tiny plastic beads. Please just take one and hold on to it for a moment. You can slip it into your pocket if you like, if you think you're in danger of losing it. Uh, these are beads that are available from um, a certain uh, Swedish store that I won't mention, and they come in a jar which, according to the label, contains 17,000 beads. Now, I find that very hard to believe, but they've never lied to me before, except when they said that the tool to build a bookcase would be in the case, <laughs> and that the instructions were straightforward, and it would be really, really easy, and it was very unlikely that I'd build it upside down. Apart from that, they've never actually uh, lied to me. These are tiny, tiny beads. And they're actually used, uh, they're a children's thing, you use them to build a picture on a plastic base and you iron over it with a piece of greaseproof paper. You iron it and the heat forms a picture. And when I've got to the end of what I want to share with you about Zacchaeus, we're going to come back to these beads and use them as a way of really trying to get under this idea that God uh, speaks to us. Let's look at the story of Zacchaeus for a few moments together. It's in Luke chapter 19. If you want to be following it, feel free to do that verses 1 to 10. I'll be referring to it uh, on and off. If you want to just listen, that's uh, absolutely fine. I want to take three things, just explore them together, three thoughts from this story, three ideas that it's really um, spoken to me over the last few weeks and that I hope will connect with what we're doing at uh, Spring Harvest this year. Firstly, the most obvious thing about this, it is a story about climbing. Now, I love it because actually there are very, very few stories in the Bible about climbing and about climbing trees. I used to love climbing trees uh, when I was a kid. And we kind of think actually climbing a tree, that's pretty normal. Okay, let's find out how normal it is. We don't know how old Zacchaeus was, but he was old enough to have A, gone on really well in his career, made a lot of money, bought a house, built a really bad rep reputation in the town. It would take me, well, uh, yeah, I, it would take you till you mid-30s, 40s, to get that much established. So Zacchaeus is not a young man. Now, here, let's do a little test. All of you in this room who are in this tent who are over 25, put your hand up if you have climbed a tree since you were 25 years old. That's not bad. Put your hand up if you have climbed a tree in the last year. That's not bad. Okay, give me a wave if it's really quite a long time since you've climbed a tree. Quite a lot, yeah, okay. Thank you, wonderful. It isn't exactly part of everyday life for tax collectors to be climbing trees. And for some of us, one of the reasons we don't is because it's gonna be a lot more difficult now than it would have been a few years ago. There's slightly more of us to climb and uh, slightly more to lift up. I remember climbing a tree when I was very young. When I was a kid, we lived in Ireland, and uh, we had a cottage down on the southeast coast of Ireland, wonderful place. We just ran wild in the area, and uh, we had a little gang of us used to hang out. Our nearest neighbor had four uh, conifers at the bottom of their uh, meadow, quite tall. The tallest one was about 40 foot, I think. The shortest, about 20 foot. And we used to try and uh, climb them. When I was about four, um, I tried to climb the tallest of them. We'd had a kind of pecking order. We each had our trees. My tree was one just near our house that was really easy. Um, and the older children were, uh, were, had, had conquered the big trees. But I thought I would climb this big one. So I set out to climb this, uh, I think it was about 40 foot uh, conifer. I discovered a couple of things on the way up. Uh, one of which is that the branches are a heck of a lot more dense than you expect them to be. But I discovered three things when I got to the top. First thing I discovered was that those branches are really uncomfortable to sit on when you get up there. 
Second thing I discovered is you get a fantastic view in that moment when, you can, when your head breaks out from the foliage. You do real tree climbers are getting into this, aren't you? When you break out from it, you get a wonderful view and you know what's coming. The third thing I was discovered is I had no idea how to get back down. <laughs> Absolutely none. It's actually much easier to get up a tree than it is to get down it, especially when you're four years old. So I sat there for about half an hour and uh, someone who was with me ran and fetched my elder brother who climbed up and kind of uh, coaxed me down and it was a fairly uh, interesting experience. But tree climbing is pretty common amongst kids. It's a childish thing. It's not that common amongst tax collectors and it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort for a grown man to kind of get to that place where you grab the lowest branch and you swing yourself up and you scramble up and you climb and you've got cuts on your knees and it's, it takes a lot of effort to do that. So this climbing thing is really a picture of effort. Let me mention a couple of verses in the Old Testament that I found about climbing that I find really, really interesting. One of them comes from that wonderful book, The uh, Song of Songs, which is so rarely talked about in our churches because the youth group giggle too much. Um, but it's a wonderful verse, and it says this, I said I will climb up into the palm tree and take hold of its branches. Now may your breasts be like grape clusters and the scent of your breath like apples. It's giving us climbing as a picture of passion. It's using this image of climbing to represent the idea of a passionate love, a devoted love. And the effort of climbing is used there as a metaphor to express love. Here's another one that comes in the prophet Habakkuk, which isn't about a tree, it's about a tower, but hey, it's still climbing. I will climb up into my watchtower now and wait to see what the Lord will say to me, how he will answer my complaint. So with climbing is a picture of passion, but it's also a way of waiting. Climbing is something you do to wait for God to speak. And there's a history, there's a thread right through Christian history. The Celts had prayer towers. There are many spots in Christian history where the idea of climbing is used as a, as, a, as a model of saying, I want to go to a place where I can wait to hear from God. And in fact, many of us here would still exercise that in terms of hill climbing. Quite often, the reason you get to a high place is to listen to God. It's to wait for God. And both those things seem to be present in this man, Zacchaeus. He does seem to be driven by a kind of passion to see Jesus, a determination. We don't know why. I don't know why he knew so much about Jesus. I don't know why he had already realized how important Jesus was. But he has this drive to see him, so much so that he's prepared to run down the street, behave like a child, climb up a tree, because he needs to see Jesus. There's a passion there, and there's a waiting there. There's an anticipation. There's a wonderful moment in this story when Zacchaeus is poised in his tree, and it says, for Jesus was coming that way. And there's this approach that happens. What's going to happen? Who's going to speak? What's he going to hear? It's a passion and it's a waiting for God to speak. Let me quote you some words that I discovered a few years ago that I found quite chilling, really, and very appropriate, I believe, to my generation. Robert Louis Stevenson, the writer, described his own generation as suffering from the malady of not wanting. And I believe as Christians and as people, forget the Christian's tag, as people in our culture, we suffer very often from the malady of not wanting. We don't want anything enough to work for it. There's a lack of passion very often in our lives. And there's a lack of passion in our Christianity. If I'm honest, in many of the more traditional churches I visit, I think there's, this, there's an absence of passion because there's a sort of, there's a new liturgy that's been written in recent years or unwritten where no matter what the guy at the front says, the liturgical response is always, whatever. Hallelujah, Jesus is risen. Whatever. God is with you. Whatever. And there's a lack of passion in our churches. Many of our churches, many of our churches, people come into them, and they don't leave saying, what are all these people so excited about? They think, where is the excitement? Where's the passion? But hey, you're thinking, why is he criticizing traditional churches? Let me tell you where there's a lack of passion in the charismatic churches, which I visit often. There's a really interesting thing there, because the passion that Zacchaeus shows is passion to seek the blessing of God. Do you know what the charismatic equation is? When God gives me the blessing, I'll be passionate. The charismatic equation is, God, if you bless me, I'll never leave you. What did Jacob say? I will not let you go until you bless me. This is not about the passion that comes because God has blessed it. It's about the passion we apply to seeking the blessing of God. So this isn't some deal about traditional, charismatic, whatever. It's about people having the passion to be willing to seek the blessing of God. 
And throughout Scripture, there are references to this idea of seeking God. If you seek God, you will find Him. If you seek Him with all your heart, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. There's this, Im- this thread running through Scripture saying, if you seek God, you will find Him. Where is the passion that drives us to seek after God? Those, that idea of Jacob wrestling the angel was the inspiration for a fabulous song that was created by a group of people in Glasgow called the Late Late Service. It's one of the early uh, alternative worship collectives. Fabulous thing. And they produced some really good worship songs. And they wrote this great song. And ever since I've heard it, it has lodged in my head. Many, many times when I'm praying or when I'm faced with difficult circumstances, these words come back to me. Jacob wrestled with the angel. Jesus argued with the devil. To be holy is to struggle free from every kind of evil. You've got to struggle. You've got to fight for freedom. You've got to struggle. You've got to fight for freedom. Jacob wrestled with the angel. Jesus argued with the devil. To be holy is to struggle free from every kind of evil. And there is a wrestling in Christian spirituality that many of us have lost touch with. And Zacchaeus didn't wrestle his way up the tree. I don't know how he got up there. But the climbing is just an image of saying, I'm making an effort to see Jesus. I'm going to fight for this blessing. I'm going to seek this. I'm going to put some grit and determination into this. And for many of us this week, this week is actually going to be about recovering that determination and that passion, that willingness to wrestle to find the blessing of God. The question is how high are we prepared to climb? Do we have the passion to climb and the willingness to wait for God's blessing? Are we prepared to put time and energy and say, God, I need to hear from you. I need this thing in my life. I need these things to be sorted. And I'm prepared to climb or wrestle or fight or whatever the analogy is to find you. So it's a picture of climbing, being willing to to put ourselves in a place where God can speak. It's also a story of connecting, which I feel is the most dynamic and exciting thing about this story. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's a story of connecting. Zacchaeus connects with Jesus. What happens is Zacchaeus is up in his tree waiting to see Jesus and then when Jesus goes by, instead of Zacchaeus just having a good vantage point to see Jesus and to hear what he has to say, Jesus stops and he looks into the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to be a guest in your home. And the connection is two-way. Zacchaeus connects with Jesus, Jesus connects with Zacchaeus. There's an electricity about it. It is fabulous, because actually, as it it came across brilliantly in that sketch, he made haste to come down. There's this almost an instant transformation in the personality of, of, of Zacchaeus. His connection with Jesus, eyeball to eyeball, is so profound that he rushes to get down the tree, and he's full of joy all of a sudden. This miserable little man who's been cheating people and running away from the crowd and rejected and fed up, and, and grumpy and climbing his tree is suddenly trans full of joy because he wants to see because he's connected with Jesus. What is the power of that connection? What is it that makes this transformation or the beginnings of the transformation so instant? Why is it that Zacchaeus up in his tree is so transformed by Jesus stopping and looking at him? And I was thinking about this a few weeks ago and at the same time I was reading a a book by um, a wonderful Canadian writer called Ronald Rollheiser. I recommend him to you. He's a Catholic. He teaches contemplative spirituality. He's a psychologist. Uh, he's very much in the vein of uh, Henri Nouard, I suppose, if you know his writing. And Rollheiser was writing about the idea of blessing, writing about the idea that we have the, the capacity in our lives to bless people or to curse them. We have the capacity to pass on blessing. And there's a phrase in the middle of what he says which absolutely stopped me in my tracks as I was thinking about Zacchaeus. He says this, to be seen is to be blessed. To be seen is to be blessed. And he gives a couple of examples. He talks about the baptism of Jesus, where the Father says over Jesus, you are my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And it's God the Father acknowledging Jesus' presence and his identity. He talks about families where very often uh, he he, he had a a family who were good friends of his and their teenage daughter, always been a very stable home, the teenage daughter started to shoplift and got worse and worse and worse till finally she was arrested, she was at the police station and her father had to come and sort it out. And this was really strange. The parents had no idea what was going on. They were really confused because this girl had been really, really stable. Nothing like this had happened before. 
And then he started to talk to them and he discovered that the marriage was a bit tense. And because the marriage was tense, the father had been spending more and more time at work and less and less time at home. And the girl wanted to be seen by her father. So she went and got herself arrested. Because we need to be seen by those who are significant to us. The most powerful example of this for me is what I live through at the moment because I have a four-year-old son. It's called Jacob. I absolutely love him to bits. Um, he's, he is wonderful, and, uh, uh, but he needs to be seen. And there are times, I remember one recently, I have this terrible habit, um, it's called manhood. I'm a man, okay, which means I can never quite, I can be at home, but I can never quite focus on being, you know what I mean, don't you? I can never quite focus on being at home. So I'll be at home, but there's always something really, really important that needs doing. I'll have my laptop on the kitchen table, or I'll try to read some article or write something, and I'm always trying to do these supposedly important things. And Jacob, I remember recently, I was sitting at the kitchen table doing something silly on my laptop. It was actually completely pointless, but hey, it makes you feel that it's important. I'm doing this stuff. And Jacob comes in and he said, look at this, Daddy. Now, fathers, I need to explain something to you here. You know that trick you do? When they say, look at this, and you think, well, I'll catch their eye, and then when they go to doing the thing and distract it, I'll go back to my laptop, or I'll go back to my newspaper. It doesn't work. They say, no, 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 no. Look at this, Daddy. I want you to see what I'm doing. And they're doing this trivial little thing. And as soon as they, you've seen them do it, they toddle off and they're as happy as Larry, whoever Larry is. They're fine. But if you don't look at them and see what they're doing, they will say, no, I want you to see what I'm doing. Because they need to be seen. And those of us who are significant in the lives of others, whether it's through parenting or through other, some other form of relationship or authority, brothers and sisters, husbands, wives, we have the capacity to bless those around us simply by acknowledging their existence, by seeing them. Do you know, I've come to the view, and I don't know whether this, I was had a, talking to a friend here last week who's a consultant psychiatrist, and I kind of, he never gave me the, the official view on whether this was sound teaching or not. I have no idea. But I've come to the view that one of the fundamental reasons for dysfunction in our culture, one of the fundamental reasons for violence and crime, is that too many people remain unacknowledged for most of their lives. They are not seen. And I've made a vow as a parent, I'm pretty hopeless at a lot of parenting things, I don't mind admitting that, like the rest of you, I get too busy, I get too tired, I get too distracted, I don't give my kids all those things that the books tell you you're supposed to give them, but I have made a vow that there is one thing I will do for my children, I've, done, I've got four kids and I've done it for every one of them and I do it for Jake now, and that is on every conceivable occasion that it's possible, I will look them in the eye and I will say, I love you and I am proud of you. Because I believe that my kids can face anything if they know that the, the father who is significant in their lives has looked at them and said, you are loved. You exist. We speak into being the lives of our children. We prophesy over them by acknowledging their existence. And there are some people in this world doing extraordinarily awful things, terrible things, getting involved in drugs and crime, simply because nobody has ever looked them in the eye and said, you exist. You matter. To be seen is to be blessed. And I believe that what we see in Zacchaeus, I think the aching in the heart of Zacchaeus' life, the hole in his life, the longing of his heart, the deepest need that he had was not to see Jesus at all. He did not need to see Jesus. He needed to be seen. He may not have been conscious of that, but what he was driven by, I think it's really interesting. Do you climb a tree to hide? I don't think so. We teach our children in Sunday school, Zacchaeus was little, so he climbed the tree to see Jesus. And that's what the text says, and that's true. But I think he also climbed the tree to be seen. And the moment that somebody looked him in the eye and said, you exist, somebody he respected, his, his whole demeanor was transformed. We need to be seen. Eugene Peterson says this. I, I love this quote from a, a book called Leap Over the Wall, Earthly Spirituality for Everyday Christians. The gospel is never about everybody else. It is always about you, about me. The gospel is never truth in general, it is always truth in specific. The gospel is never a commentary on ideas or cultures and conditions. It's always about actual persons, actual pains, actual troubles, actual sins. You, me, who you are and what you've done, who I am and what I've done. And that's what Zacchaeus discovered. The gospel comes alive when it becomes about me.
because he was seen. I believe Jesus, in the, by stopping, by looking to him, by saying, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm coming to your house, I believe Jesus spoke a blessing into his life that had been withheld from him, certainly for years, possibly for the whole of his life. He had been rejected. People sniggered when he walked past. They swore at him. They hated him. He cheated them. He was trapped in all this corruption. He was, he was, he was a kind of a, a social leper in Jericho. He knew that the people who pretended to be his friends weren't really his friends. It was just all about money. And the, the Zacchaeus inside had never been seen. And Jesus looked into his eye and in an instant changed his life by seeing him. Ezekiel has uh, an interesting passage that relates to this about trees again, which is kind of interesting. Let me read these words to you. The Sovereign Lord says, I will take a tender shoot from the top of a tall cedar. I will plant it on the top of Israel's highest mountain. It will become a noble cedar, sending forth its branches and producing seed. Birds of every sort will nest in it, finding shelter beneath its branches. And listen to this. And all the trees will know that it is I, the Lord, who cuts down the tall tree and helps the short tree grow tall. Isn't that beautiful? And what Jesus is demonstrating is that his eye is not drawn to the tall and the powerful. His, not, his eye is not drawn to the people who always get attention. I had a friend at school who was tall and he was so frustrated because whenever there was a need for somebody to be in charge, they asked him to be in charge just because he was tall. There is this thing in our culture where we look to powerful people and the eye of Jesus is drawn to those who are short in different ways ways. And Jesus connected with Zacchaeus, the little man, the rejected man, the corrupt man, the man full of sin and he knew it, broken relationships, the lot. Jesus connected with him in a way that he had not experienced. So for some of us this week, the question is how high are we prepared to, be, to, to climb? Let's be honest, for some of us this week, the question is how deep is your longing to be seen? We don't want you, I don't want you to become so caught up in the idea that you've come to Spring Harvest to see Jesus, that you forget that you've come to Spring Harvest to be seen by Jesus. And if your priority is to know that God has seen you, then make that your priority. Don't get bogged down with all the other stuff. Because there will be some people who are sitting here tonight and others who are on their way and others in the chalets and others in other venues. There will be some people at Spring Harvest this week who will leave at the end of the week knowing for the first time in months or years, possibly for the first time in their lives, that God sees them and that those words spoken over Jesus at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, are spoken over every single one of us. This is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Some of us are going to hear those words possibly for the first time this week. Lastly, this is also a story of change. That's why we teach it in Sunday school. It's a conversion story. It's a change story. But there's a really interesting thing in the text. You have to uh, explore it closely. But in between Jesus talking to Zacchaeus at the bottom of the tree and Jesus saying, salvation has come to this house, the story actually moves. There are gaps always in the, the gospel narrative. The story is condensed, but it actually moves. The scene at the end of the story is actually at Zacchaeus' house after a conversation has taken place. Because the people say he has gone to be with a sinner. And then Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. So it's clear that the narrative actually jumps at this point. The scene shifts from by the tree to at the house. And Jesus has begun to, to talk with Zacchaeus. And there's been this relationship and change results. Just in these last couple of minutes, I want to ask you a question that I find challenging and interesting. And I think it will challenge many of us this week. And it's this question. How does change take place in our lives? How does change take place in our lives? Where does Christian growth come from? And there's a wonderful clue in this idea that Jesus says to Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to be a guest in your home. It resonates with that verse in Revelation 3.20, which I'm sure most of you know and which will be mentioned at time and again this week as we look at the letters to the churches where Jesus says, look, here I stand at the door and knock. If you hear me calling and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal as friends. Jesus said to Zacchaeus, come down, I want to be a guest in your home. I want to share a meal with you. Actually, Jesus makes himself beholden to Zacchaeus. He, he doesn't say, Zacchaeus, come down, because I want you to be my guest. He says, Zacchaeus, come down, I am going to be your 
guest. And there's a model in there of how change happens, which I think is really, really important. Let me just say a couple of things about it. Firstly, the meal, the meal table has been, since time began, well, I don't know, I wasn't there, but since meals began, since tables began, the meal table in virtually every culture in the world has been the fundamental symbol of human community. It still is in most places. We're killing it off with the microwave and all that nonsense. But some of us still manage to gather around the meal table. If you go to Mediterranean cultures, uh, if you go across most of uh, Europe, the further you get away from urbanization, the more you find cultures where gathering around a meal table is, a, is the fundamental symbol of human community. In Arab culture, it is a sacrament. It is the ultimate gift you can give someone to invite them to be at your table. Sharing salt, sharing a meal is a statement of human community. So what Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus, and I want you to hear this because this is the most, possibly the most important slant, if you like, on the whole teaching program at Spring Harvest this year. Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus, let me meet you in your humanity. Let me meet you in the place where your life is real and earthed. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, don't go to the, don't, I, want, I don't want you to come with me to the synagogue or the temple. I want to come and sit at your table. I have a wonderful friend, uh, Cyril Ashton, who I've known for a couple of years, who recently became uh, Bishop of Doncaster. And I met him a couple of years ago. He was director of a course I was doing. Lovely, lovely man. And he, he gave us some lectures, and then he made it absolutely clear that it was his responsibility to make sure we all ended up in the pub later. And he took us all there. And... Uh, told some very, very um, appropriately Anglican and bishoply jokes. Any of you who know bishops will know what I mean by uh, bishoply jokes. We had a great time together, had a few drinks and stuff. And in the midst of this, he told me, he said, five years ago, he said, having been in ministry for years, man now, it was in his early 50s, five years ago, he said, I read the Gospels from cover to cover. I read all four of the Gospels. I wanted to understand how Jesus did ministry. What did Jesus think evangelism was? What did Jesus think ministry was? Do you know what he said? He said, I came to the inescapable conclusion that Jesus spent the vast majority of his time eating, drinking, and making friends. Do you know what he did? He got down on his knees, this soon-to-be bishop, and he said, God, I commit the rest of my life and ministry to eating, drinking, and making friends. <laughs> and that's what he does. When he has to help out a vicar who's in trouble, he doesn't go and give him a strategy or a plan. He just goes and says, how can I be a friend? And Jesus meets people in friendship around a meal table. He wants to commune with you. He doesn't want to throw doctrine at you and make you feel bad about yourself and all this stuff. He just wants to commune with us. He wants to be our guest, a dinner companion, bringing us to conviction, not through fiery sermons, but through conversation and communion. It goes a bit further than that because Zacchaeus actually puts Jesus into the role of priest. When he says this thing at the end of the passage, you can read it, he says... Uh, if I've taken anything from the poor, I'm, I'll give half my goods to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone, I'll pay them back fourfold. That was part of the Levitical law. Jews were required to do that. But here's what's interesting. The law says, if you've cheated anyone, pay them back fourfold, and then what? Then go and find a priest and tell the priest what you've done. But Zacchaeus is disillusioned with the priest. The temple means nothing to him. Religion doesn't help. So Jesus becomes his priest at that moment. And their conversation results in genuine spiritual change. Jesus gives him absolution. Jesus offers him forgiveness. Jesus then proclaims salvation, announcing that the lost can be found. Salvation has come to this house. All because they shared a meal together. All because Zacchaeus opened up his humanity to this Jesus. Let me tell you something really, really interesting about Jesus. Jesus does not say to you, Come and join my story. Jesus does not offer you the opportunity to join his story, to become part of his life. Do you know what he offers you? He says, let me join you in your story. Let me be a guest in your... Do you know what Jesus is going to say to some people this week? Let me be a guest in your marriage. Let me be a guest in your parenting. Let me be a guest in your home. Let me be a guest in your workplace. Let me be a guest in your ambitions. Let me be a guest in those things you struggle with. Let me, Jesus is saying, I don't want you to come out of your life and join some kind of holy, churchy, religious, secto, weirdo thing. I just want to come and be with you in your life like those two guys who are walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus is just walking with them, sharing their lives. And some of you are going to realize this week that change is not about big moments, though those happen. It's not about coming to the front, though that sometimes helps. 
It's not about instant things, though those sometimes help. It's about companionship with Jesus. It's about opening up your humanity and all your failings and your miseries and the fact that you're a hopeless parent and your job's going down the toilet and your money's all over the place and everything's going wrong. Just saying, Jesus, come and be with me in all this. And one of the main reasons why Jesus is not in our lives more is we don't invite him. He asks permission. He says, will you invite me? Will you let me be your guest? And we don't invite him. We think we have to wait until he invites us to do some big thing. He's just saying, let me be your guest. Let me be your companion. Let me share your meals. Let me just be part of all that you are in your humanity. And Zacchaeus understands through this wonderful relationship, three things happen to him. Jesus connects, and through seeing him, blessing him, that opens up Zacchaeus' life. So he talks with Jesus, and through that companionship, change results. So the third question, if the first question was how high are we prepared to climb, and the second question is how deep is our need to be seen, third question is very simple. What stage are you at in this invitation? You know when someone's coming for dinner? and you're rushing around, what are you doing? Are you laying the table? Are you opening the door? Are you uncorking the wine? Where are you at in your invitation for Jesus to come and be a guest in your life? Are you at that point where the doorbell rings and you think, oh no, they've got the wrong day, I'm not ready, I haven't cooked anything, I'm wearing the wrong clothes. If I wait long enough and pretend I'm not here, they'll go away. Mustn't twitch the curtain so they don't know I'm here. Ah! That kind of thing. Are you at the stage where you think it might not happen? Or are you at the stage of saying, let's lay the table. Let's create space. Let's have conversation. Let's invite Jesus to come and be part of our humanity with all its frailties, all its weaknesses, all its failures. Let's come and be with us. And Zacchaeus was able to face up to his failings, to face up to his weaknesses, to pay back the debt because Jesus came and met him at that point. How high are we prepared to climb? What passion do we have to meet with God? How deep is our need, not just to see Jesus, but to be seen, to know that we are known? And what stage are we at in this invitation, laying the table so that Jesus can be our guest? Let's just go back to these beads for a moment. Did they get out there? Have you got them? Deep joy. You don't know how happy that makes me. They're tiny little things, these beads. I just want to encourage you. Uh, you, you, have, you have my permission to completely ignore me as I say this, by the way. If you think beads are silly, that's fine. Don't worry. Just stick them in your pocket. But if you want to use this as a way of just kind of earthing some of the things you've heard, then just hold the bead in your hand for a moment. What's going to happen? We're gonna, there's going to be some uh, music playing, just some uh, instrumental music and uh, on the CD, and there's going to be some images that come up. In a few moments, I'm going to read a poem. And I want us to just take this time to reflect on the vastness of God and this remarkable miracle. Do you know the fundamental miracle of Christianity is that God can love everybody and you. That God can love three and a half thousand people and one person. It's a miracle that is not repeated in any other philosophy or religious system. It's a fundamental miracle that you can be part of the largest movement in the history of the world and yet be recognized as an individual. You can be in a huge crowd and yet be recognized. And the little bead is a symbol of something that the picture, the big picture, is made up of all kinds of colors. When you use these beads to assemble a color, each little bead fits in and the big picture emerges. And God sees us. He values each one of us. He holds each one of us in his hand. What might it mean for us this week if we truly discovered, truly discovered the extent to which God sees and knows and loves each one of us? Let's just think on these things and reflect. I'll read these words and then then there'll be some space for you to just reflect and pray quietly if you want to. This God, this God who watches worlds, sees my heart. This careful calculator, counting countless millions, counts me in. This artist 
whose canvas outstretches eternity at both ends, whose palette outcolors planets, paints my portrait. This lover who dreams in universes dreams of me. This creator whose breadth of vision spans time and spawns a cosmos, whose woven tapestry of purpose, more compound than chaos, ex eclipsing complexity, rolls out like a highway through history, whose heartbeat deafens supernovas, this craftsman hears my whispered cry. This father kisses me. This playwright, playing with the deaths and entrances of stars, scripting the end from the beginning, knowing the purpose of the play, watches my feeble audition and writes me in. Thank mm -hmm. you.